Hi everybody, this is a video about biofilms, one of my favorite topics. So many favorite topics out there, but biofilms, always a good, always a good time talking about those. Um, <clears throat> just before I jump into the meat and potatoes of the video here, um, if you enjoy my content, if you don't mind taking a minute to like or share or subscribe or whatever is appropriate on the given platform that you're watching this video on, um, please and thank you. Uh, just appreciate any love that you can send my channel or account or whatever. Anyways, again, whatever platform you're watching, whatever the appropriate lingo is. So I uh, thank you um, in advance if you don't mind taking the time to do that. Um, so somebody posted a question on one of my other videos um, asking about um, what type of biofilm would likely be um, uh, afoot if uh, given a certain type of infection. So specifically the question was about uh, this condition called mycoplasma genitalis and would it be more likely that there's a phase one or a phase two biofilm um, in that associated with that type of infectious microbe and therefore what type of biofilm disruptor would be the most appropriate to choose. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, as per usual, cannot give any medical advice over social media. Um, this is for informational purposes only and if you need medical advice please talk to your clinician to get that medical advice. Um, but just again for informational purposes only, um, with something like um, mycoplasma genitalis or really you know any infection, it really largely has to do with where that, um, that microbe is located and how long that microbe has been there for. So <clears throat> when it comes to biofilms, um, there are phase one and phase two biofilms. Phase one biofilms are quite easy to break down. Um, therefore, there's a wider range of tools that can be used, a wider range of tools that can be used to break those down. Phase two biofilms are much more tenacious. Um, it's like the difference between trying to get, you know, a thin layer of a, you know, residue off of a dish in your sink versus like a really thick layer of grease is just going to require different tools and more time and elbow grease, forgive the pun, to get rid of, you know, one versus the other. <clears throat> um, the other has to do with location. So generally speaking, pretty much anything that's not in the, um, in the mouth cavity is going to be a lot uh, more likely to to build up, um, and, and what I mean by that is, of course, you know, we fill our biofilms on our teeth. That's why by the end of the day, if you, especially if you go a little bit too long without brushing your teeth, especially if you're eating things that are more sugary or carby, you're going to feel like a little bit more fuzziness on your teeth. That's literally a biofilm. You brush it away, um, or sometimes a biofilm will form on the tongue, and you need to brush that away. Um, but outside of an area like that where there's like a direct mechanical um, breaking down happening on a regular basis, biofilms that might form in the blood vessels, that might form in the joints, that might form in the uh, vaginal canal, that might form in the bladder. <clears throat> um, these are all areas where there's not going to be that, you know, abrasive disruption um, happening. Um, and so generally speaking, any place where there's an internal biofilm forming, and especially if that microbe is being left to its own devices for a prolonged period of time, then you're going to be much more likely to be dealing with a phase two biofilm. So it's not to say like, oh, these microbes make phase one and these microbes make phase two. Um, phase two is just a phase one, uh, um, a phase two is just what was once a phase one biofilm, but it's become uh, tenacious enough, filled with enough heavy metals to give it more, you know, literal infrastructure, like literal scaffolding inside that it can build on and, and ultimately become a lot harder to break down. So. Um, Timeline wise, in terms of like what's a long time versus a short time to have microbes afoot, um, I'm, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure if there's any sort of a universally accepted uh, number um, to, in, in response to that question. Um, clinically, at least, um, in my experience, if someone's been having issues for a couple of years or more, we're probably pretty much definitely dealing with phase two biofilms. If it's less than two years, we might still be just dealing with phase one, um, but those are not hard and fast numbers, but that's just kind of the rough um, uh, assessment that I use in my mind for, for that, those numbers. Um, and then just as a quick reminder, I've mentioned this in some other videos, but when it comes to phase one biofilm disruptors, these would be things like enzymes, like so uh, natokinase, stratioheptidase, um, also, um, uh, aromatic herbs, so things that have like kind of a, a pungent aroma to them or like essential oils or things like that. Um, and then your phase two biofilm disruptors are going to be more uh, things that are um, like heavy metal chelators like DMSA, DMPS, EDTA. Um, silver is a phase two biofilm disruptor. Bismuth is a biofilm, a phase two biofilm disruptor. And then R plus alpha lipoic acid that's combined with bismuth creates this dithiol molecule that makes a really strong phase two biofilm disruptor as well. Um, with NAC, it's a biofilm disruptor. I've heard kind of mixed things. Um, some folks lump it into phase one, some say phase two, um, but um, it's something where 
where I haven't seen it pack nearly the punch of those other phase two biofilm disruptors that I just mentioned. So um, I, I personally kind of lump it more into phase one, but um, maybe it does have phase two like properties given enough time. I'm not sure. I love NAC just for different reasons. So thank you for the question. If anyone has any questions about uh, this topic or anything else, just post it in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer as soon as I can.